Welcome, everyone, uh, to our session on Russia and the Green New Deal. Uh, my name is John Pfeffer. I'm with the Institute for Policy Studies here in Washington, DC. And uh, we are expecting some more people to filter in. And I'll uh, describe in a few moments uh, the panel that we'll be having today. But uh, first I'll say that this is part of a larger project called the Global Just Transition Project, in which we provide updates on uh, Green New Deals and similar initiatives around the world. And we've done sessions on the European Green Deal and South Korea's Green New Deal. And uh, we have future sessions planned on uh, what's taking place in India, in China, and in Latin America. And then after that, we'll be taking a look at the situation at the multilateral level with debt and climate finance and trade. Um, we've been doing some other initiatives as well on the uh, question of deep growth, looking at the uh, question of financing in, of fossil fuel projects throughout Africa by the Chinese government and Chinese state-owned enterprises. And uh, we are also looking at the question of uh, local capacity for handling funds coming from governments to address climate change and energy transition issues. But today we're going to look at the question of Russia and Russia and the Green, Green New Deal. Those of you who have followed Russia know that uh, Russia has a rather large carbon footprint um, and has been slow to discuss uh, a clean energy transition. Russia is heavily dependent, of course, on its oil and gas uh, industries, both for um, uh, domestic use, but of course also for exports. Uh, however, there has been a thriving and very exciting environmental movement inside Russia. And uh, there has also been the uh, promotion of a Green New Deal, which we'll hear about today. We're going to start with Vasily Yablokov of Greenpeace, talking about Russia's climate emergency. Uh, and then we will uh, go with Tatyana Lanshina of goal number seven. And uh, we'll finish up with Arshak Makichan of Fridays for Future. Um, Vasily Yablokov with Greenpeace, Tatyana Lapshina with goal number seven. Uh, goal number seven, of course, is the seventh goal of the Sustainable Development Goals, which calls for ensuring access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. And then Arshak Makichian, Fridays for Future, many of you are familiar with that movement um, of uh, mostly young people. But we'll start with uh, Vasily Yablokov, um, who has been the head of climate and, and energy at Greenpeace. He's been working for uh, Greenpeace Russia for nine years. Uh, before that, he was a researcher at the Kronotsky Natural Reserve in Kamchatka for four years. So he has uh, a good on the ground experience with some of, the, uh, some of the front lines of Russia's climate crisis. Um, hi all, nice to uh, be here. And uh, thank you, John, to inviting. Uh, and yeah, I will talk about Russian climate and emergency. And yeah, recently the Russian government has been talking a lot about climate change and the connection of natural disasters with the climate emergency. And it is actually happening. Uh, for example, today, as always, there are climate anomalies in the Western part. Uh, it's colder by the 15 degrees. In the Far East, it's warmer by 20 degrees than average and climate normal. Uh, and the warming rate in Russia uh, on average uh, is uh, near uh, half degree per decade, which is uh, uh, two and uh, half times higher than the global average. The entire area, especially 
uh, the Arctic zone is under the impact of climate change and uh, uh, 20th and 2020 was the warmest year in the history of uh, observation. Uh, the number of dangerous nature disasters in Russia has grown by more than three times out of the past uh, decades compared to previous ones. And according to uh, Ross Hydromet, uh, is uh, like a federal uh, service for environmental monitoring. Uh, in uh, 2020, the number of dangerous disaster amounted to 1,000 and uh, uh, 372 caused significant damage to the economy and well-being of, of people. While rainfalls uh, increases are uh, resulting in flooding in the southern agriculture region, uh, droughts, uh, droughts and crop uh, failures increase. Uh, and uh, this year was a record year, not only in the scale of uh, forest fires, uh, their area, according to uh, also to official data, uh, is uh, approaching uh, uh, 90 million hectares and uh, continues to grow, but also uh, in the number of fires in the Arctic zone. The uh, uh, saddest thing uh, in this situation uh, is not even the scale of the fire, uh, but how regular they uh, began to occur. Uh, the disaster has been happening for the fourth year in a row, uh, and the scale is growing, and experts uh, predict that such disaster will continue possibly every year. Uh, and this year, uh, fires in Yakutia were especially catastrophic. According to experts, uh, 800 million tons of CO2 emission came to the atmosphere uh, only from these fires. Uh, in addition, fires uh, cause smoke uh, in the large cities in Siberia, especially in Siberia, uh, which is extremely dangerous for human health, uh, especially during uh, a difficult period of uh, pandemic. Uh, it's spread of, uh, spread of climate related infection diseases uh like uh, encephalitis lyme diseases uh some uh, hemorrhagic uh, fevers uh yeah yeah it's uh, like mostly of, of these diseases is tropical but now uh there are some cases in the north region and cities um this year flood in the uh floods in the krasnodar area and the far east even took people lives uh uh, on the Black Sea coast, uh, floods were almost all summer, which caused uh, serious damage to the tourism industry. The number of the uh, emergency, like in, it, it was in uh, near 40 region in this year. Uh, the permafrost cover uh, near 60% uh, of country, and this is a huge territory which started to melt, uh, to melt everywhere. And uh, this year holds the record of the size of uh, seasonally melted layer. And the uh, melting of permafrost leads uh, to the destruction of the roads, oil and gas infrastructure, accidents uh, and uh, oil spills. One of the reasons for the accident in the Nariz last year uh, was the uh, melting uh, of like, permafrost in this area. And uh, several hundred spills occur annually, uh, but no one knows for sure since uh, there is no systematic observation because it's also a huge area. And uh, permafrost is the frozen organics uh, and when it uh, melts, a strong greenhouse gas like methane, methane is released and it's a huge problem because uh, there's some expert named it like a methane bomb. Uh, this is the feedback effect. Burning fossil fuel in the world leads uh, to a slight increase in temperature. Methane is released and the temperature grows even faster. Uh, that is why methane is released even more and the temperature already grows very fast. So I, ho uh, I have already talked about dangerous diseases. Uh, they also appear due to the throwing of uh, permafrost. Uh, for example, in uh, 2016, uh, there was an outbreak of anthrax.
uh, which caused the death of huge uh, herds of deer and indigenous communities uh, suffered a lot. Uh, in addition, yeah, this is a slide from these uh, like cases. And uh, in addition uh, to frost, Arctic ice disappears. This year holds another minimum record, which also leads uh, to an increase in albedo and a large heat uh, absorption by the Arctic Ocean. Therefore, the changes in the circulation of the cyclones through the region and the huge number of weather anomalies are recorded through the uh, for the territories. And nevertheless, uh, this doesn't stop uh, the Russian government from new infra infrastructure project and uh, in the region, including drilling wells, oil and gas production, which is not economically uh, feasible and very dangerous in such condition. In addition, there are opportunity for sea traffic along the Northern Sea route uh, road and increased traffic can also uh, negatively affect to the Arctic environment. And uh, yeah, in, con uh, in conclusion, Russia does not evaluate the climate risk, uh, so we don't know the exact cost of what uh, for those region uh, we do uh, we do evaluate it. Uh, their cost uh, can be huge because we see an obvious impact of human health and uh, Russia does not uh, yet have a clear plan for how to adopt uh, to climate change and on the next year plan uh, should appear in the region. But uh, we see that uh, there is no clear understanding of climate risk. And uh, meanwhile, Russian citizens have concern about climate change. According to surveys, uh, they see that most people are worried about the future uh, and uh, perceive the climate change as a threat. Uh, in addition to the fact uh, that Russia is very badly affected by climate change, uh, our country is still one of the main emitters of greenhouse gases. Thank you, Vasily. That was excellent. We got a really good picture of, of a, well, a, unfortunately, somewhat depressing situation. Um, I'd like to turn now to uh, Tatiana Lapshina. Um, and Tatiana uh, is with an organization called Goal Number no. Seven. And as I said, Goal Number no. Seven, and maybe Tatiana can will explain more about this, but Goal number seven comes from the Sustainable Development Goals, and the goal states ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. And uh, goal number seven has launched um, international renewable energy certificates uh, as part of a system of providing incentives for sustainable energy producers and, and sustainable energy consumption. Um, and before that, or perhaps still, I don't know if you're still affiliated, but um, was with the Center of uh, Economic Modeling of, of Power and Ecology at the Institute of Science, uh, where she was involved in issues of energy modeling, development of renewable energy in Russia uh, and worldwide, analysis of the development of wind and solar power projects in Russia, development of CO2 emission reduction scenarios in Russia. Uh, thank you, John, and hello, colleagues. So yes, I, I still have two affiliations, uh, but not with the Institute of uh, Sciences, but with RANIPA. This is Russian Academy of National Economy and Public Administration. And the second affiliation is uh, the NGO goal number seven that uh, promotes renewables in Russia, as John has said. Uh, and uh, last year we had uh, a project together with Greenpeace, and so Vasily was uh, involved in this project too, and uh, we created uh, the document that was called the Russian Green Deal. Uh, unfortunately, Russia is not discussing any Green Deal at the official level at the moment, uh, but still last year, I mean 2021, <laughs> it, it is almost the last year, uh, so in 2021, we've had a lot of new developments uh, in Russia in the sphere of uh, climate policies and uh, a bit in the sphere of energy policies. So what, what changed uh, in 2021? Uh, before this year, 
uh, Russia was rather skeptical about uh, climate change and uh, about the role of uh, people in the climate change. Uh, but this year, um, a lot, uh, a lot of new events happened, and uh, actually, the official rhetoric uh, has uh, changed a bit. So now Russia officially uh, wants to achieve climate neutrality by 2016. This goal was set two months ago in October. Uh, and uh, after setting this goal, Russia has already uh, prepared uh, a strategy for achieving this goal. This strategy is called uh, the strategy of low carbon uh, development up to 2050. Uh, so there is um, a little uh, discrepancy between the goal itself, it's up to 2060, and the strategy it is up to 2015. Um, but still, despite the fact uh, that um, Russian politics and many Russian uh, corporations became more positive, about uh, climate change and about the need to combat uh, climate change. Uh, still, uh, we have a lot of uh, strategies uh, that we adopted uh, recently, uh, and they uh, say that uh, Russia is going to extract a lot of fossil fuels, it is going to increase its uh, exports of fossil fuels uh, and so they mean that uh, we are not going to change uh, the economy much and we are not going to uh, diversify it much. So for example uh, in 2020 uh, we adopted uh, the energy strategy up to 2035 and it says that uh, we will increase the volumes uh, of natural gas extraction we will try to keep the volumes of uh, oil extraction the same, uh, and we will increase the volumes of coal extraction significantly. So it contradicts uh, with the global trends uh, a lot. And another important document that was adopted in 2020 was the plan for the uh, coal industry development up, up to 2035. And it also says that Russia is going to increase uh, coal mining, the volumes of coal mining, um, and uh, it is going to uh, develop exports of coal. It also contradicts <laughs> with the global plans a lot because many countries, especially in Europe, uh, are, have, have already decided to phase out coal and it means that uh, their demand uh, for coal is already decreasing and for the demand for Russian coal in Europe uh, has started to decrease and uh, the plans in Russia are to substitute European experts by Asian experts. And in Asia, there are a lot of problems with that too, because uh, so far many uh, Asian countries uh, cannot phase out coal because their economies are developing rapidly. And despite the fact that uh, they uh, introduce a lot of renewables each year, still they need uh, more and more energy, which can come from coal at the moment. Uh, but Asian countries have huge problems with uh, environment and with people's health, with the quality of air and so on. And all these problems are understood at the official level. And uh, it means that uh, we need just several years to see uh, new decisions in Asia that uh, will uh, limit uh, the use of coal. And uh, I think that it will happen before 2030 that uh, coal demand uh, in Asia will start to decrease significantly. Uh, Russia has also adopted some new plans in 2021 after the change uh, in the official rhetorics on, on the climate. Uh, so we had uh, new plans for Kuzbas and Komi Republic to diversify their economies. The, these plans were adopted uh, in summer, in July 2021. Uh, it is a very good sign that they have been adopted, but uh, anyway, uh, they are too concentrated on extracting something and on traditional industries, and they do not foresee any 
uh, green development or any change to uh, the environment and to any shift to sustainable development. Uh, and I have already mentioned the new strategy of low carbon development uh, up to 2050. Uh, that says that Russia uh, will achieve uh, climate neutrality uh, by 2060. Uh, and um, this strategy is very, I would say, pessimistic uh, on the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it uh, says that Russia will mostly achieve its goal on climate neutrality by uh, absorption, uh, through forests, uh, so it means that uh, Russia will just recalculate its absorptive, absorptive uh, capacities uh, is, is uh, planned. So you can see that in the target intensive scenario, the emissions will uh, increase uh, by 2030 and then they will uh, go down, but only by 14% uh, compared to 2019. A few words about uh, what we proposed uh, in the Russian uh, Green Deal uh, last year together with uh, Greenpeace. So here you can see the structure of uh, Russia's uh, emissions and you can see that the bulk of emissions uh, goes for energy, it is 79% and it is like in most uh, other countries of the world, so about uh, 75 or 80% of all emissions in most countries uh, come from uh, burning fossil fuels. This is, these are all fossil fuels that are burned in any sectors. Uh, and uh, other uh, sources of emissions are industrial processes, agriculture, waste, and, and that's it. Uh, so what does it mean? It means that if we want to decrease, to substantially decrease emissions, uh, we must uh, emphasize uh, the energy sector and fossil fuels. It means that uh, clean uh, energy and energy transition are necessary to achieve the goal of climate neutrality. Uh, and this is why that was our priority in our document, uh, Russia's Green Deal. And the third priority was sustainable forestry. Uh, so in Russia, we have a huge problem with uh, forests. So like Vasily said, we have a lot of um, forest disasters each year, a lot of forests are burning and things. Uh, so we tried to bring up uh, some measures that could help improve this situation. And Russian energy sector uh, has a very low share of modern renewable energy sources like wind and solar. So at this slide you can see that uh, in most uh, largest economies, wind and solar already play a significant role in the energy sector. Um, and on average, uh, globally last year, wind and solar produced uh, about 10% of all electric power. And in Russia, you can see that uh, this share is very close to zero. So you see that uh, we have a long way to go <laughs> to uh, transit our energy sector and make it uh, greener. Uh, and here are some um, some uh, goals for the clean energy sector. So we proposed that by 2030 the share of renewables, uh, not uh, including hydropower, should uh, increase up to 20 percent. Uh, and we should have about 10% of renewables and heating and cooling sector. Uh, and by 2050, we should aim to 100% of renewables. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. That was, that was excellent. It was also very sobering, uh, your statistics on uh, Russia's plans to expand uh, the number of fossil fuel um, targets uh, and shifting markets away, for instance, coal purchases from Europe to uh, coal sales to Asia is very sobering. Um, and uh, in many respects, it looks like Russia, the, the picture you, you paint of Russia looks like 
well, the picture of many industrialized countries, but only maybe 20 years ago. I'd like to, uh, to turn to Arshak uh, Makichin, and Arshak is a Russian climate youth activist. Uh, and he, uh, in December 2019, uh, began staging solo school strikes for climate every Friday, as many of us are aware of the Friday for Future, Fridays for Future movement. Um, and this became, you know, a, a actual movement in Russia as well, very encouraging. He did this for more than 40 weeks uh, and inspired many other individual protests as well. Um, and uh, he has um, also been jailed for, for these actions uh, after coming back from Madrid in December 29, after speaking at the United Nations Climate Change Conference. That was COP25, the previous COP. Oh, thank you for inviting uh, me and others, yeah, and organizing this, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think uh, climate movement in Russia is an anomaly, like, like climate crisis is an anomaly, so, uh, the same is with climate movement, because like I found out about climate crisis from Greta Thunberg strikes, not in school or in university. So it's quite strange because there is nothing about climate in uh, schools uh, or yeah, universities. And that's the problem because uh, like our education is failing young people because mostly a lot of people don't know about climate crisis or don't understand how serious is the situation. And uh, yeah, I found out from Greta and then started to read about it. And it was quite difficult because a lot of information about climate uh, crisis was in English. And I was reading in English and trying to figure out this issue. And I was a violinist and uh, yeah, I was studying in Moscow Conservatory. And then I uh, started my strikes and to, like I gave up my career as a violinist because I understood that we should do the strikes in Russia and it's quite impossible to combine these things while being professional violinist and climate activists and we created like uh, the first climate movement in Russia we started to talk about climate crisis as a crisis because before us people were silent about climate uh, they were thinking that we have more serious issues but uh, now the situation is changing people starting to talk about climate crisis, media starting to talk about crisis and NGOs starting to talk about climate crisis because it's serious, because the world is changing and we are not from another planet. Uh, Vasily was talking about climate emergency. We had a banner, uh, climate emergency, it was in English, and like we had a strike for free people and we were detained for this strike. Uh, it was before the COP25, it was the case on you were talking about when I was arrested for six days and this banner is uh, at the police station. <laughs> so climate emergency is jailed in Russia. That's the problem. <laughs> uh, the problem is that uh, our governmental media are silent about climate crisis. Like our, mostly our media owned uh, by, by the government or by fossil fuel corporations. So they are lying to people about climate crisis. and. If in uh, uh, in the world, in different countries, uh, like media reporting the different problems like wildfires, floodings, or desertification, and they talking about climate uh, because it's connected. In Russia, they don't do this. They talking about wildfires, and that's it. So uh, it's quite a problem that people don't understand uh, how these issues connected to climate crisis. And we like a movement for doing these educational things and. We're trying to do protests, even though it's quite difficult. Like uh, this protest with this banner was just for three persons. We uh, have sent an application and the government illegally refused us. And we were just three persons on the square and we were detained. And then I was arrested for that <laughs> for six days. And uh, prison in Russia, it's not like in Europe. Uh, yeah, so it's it was not a comfortable experience like and yeah, it could be worse, much worse, because there were a lot of reports about torture in Russian prisons. And yeah, now the situation is getting uh, worse. Uh, but we did this, we organized climate movement, like uh, a lot of weeks I was striking alone, and then other people started to join uh, me, and we started to organize this movement. It was first climate movement uh, on the national scale. 
and we had like five or seven cities every Friday uh, striking for climate. It was an, an, an unusual thing for Russia because uh, a protest is not a usual thing for us. People are afraid to protest uh, uh, even before the pandemic when it was better. The situation with human rights in Russia, yeah, it was better <laughs> two years ago and now it's getting worse. And yeah, we were organizing this uh, movement and it was it's great. It, the movement was growing and then the pandemic came and the government using the pandemic uh, as an excuse to restrict human rights in Russia. And that's quite a problem because if before the pandemic, uh, the government was refusing us for right to strike together, we were organizing queues for single strike and we were organizing community, climate community in Russia. And uh, for young people, it's very important to talk with each other, to feel uh, yeah, not that they are not alone. And uh, that's uh, one uh, very important issue because activists in Russia now are marginalized because like if in Europe, like politicians meeting activists saying, oh, you're doing a great job or something like that, uh, or like major writing about uh, these activists uh, in Russia, media, even independent media are silent about activists. Uh, you, they're talking about us when you're arrested and that's it. They don't do not like support you when you're doing your work. They support you when you're arrested. It's about independent media. And like uh, the governmental media are completely silent about Russian for Ideas for Future movement. They're talking about like uh, uh, Greta Thunberg and they, it's easier to like s s s s to, to criticize her because she is from a rich country and yes, yeah, she is not striking in Russia. So the, it's quite difficult to be a, a, an activist in Russia on many levels. Uh, because we do not have this activist culture because of the our of our history, uh, like we had quite terrible history uh, during twentieth century. So uh, yeah, but we're trying to to start this and like uh, the situation is changing because uh, young people are different. They're not like <laughs> like. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the the generation before us, uh, they are not, they are afraid because like a lot of people are jailed and they they feel in this, uh, but uh, they want to change something because it's our future, and because like like uh, if you a young person in Russia, you don't, uh, do you feel that there is no place for you in Russia? So a lot of people are <laughs> going to live in other countries, and it's a problem for Russian movement as well, and for <laughs> yeah, a lot of people are fleeing from Russia because of the political persecution and things like that. But anyway, everyone cannot <laughs> leave Russia and we need to do something on the national level. So uh, I'm trying to continue to do uh, our work, even though it's getting, uh, the situation, political situation is getting worse. And that's, it's, that's why it's so important to mention uh, Navalny case when they uh, tried to poison the most famous uh, opposition in Russia. And after that, they, <laughs> when he returned to Russia, they jailed it, it, him. It's very important. It's not about climate, but it, it's about uh, poisoning and uh, jailing like human rights in Russia. Even though you're like very famous, you have a lot of support, they can, uh, they can jail you. Uh, so this situation is influencing young people because uh, they starting to feel unsafe them in this country and it's there it's a real threat uh, for everyone so people starting to be afraid even big NGOs starting to be uh, afraid uh, for their uh, safety for their existence because a lot of like most of the most of the independent media were declared foreign agents in Russia so uh, so they were the ones they they were writing about climate crisis yeah and now they are mostly foreign agents and it's, it's quite difficult for they them to exist it's quite a problem because like other wages are owned by the government or by fossil fuel corporations and so yeah but there are, of course a lot of uh, good news as well because we were a small movement in russia but we organized a lot of great campaigns like we organized the campaign about uh, when there was declared a black sky mode in krasnoyarsk uh, it's it's uh, happening because of the coal burning in uh, in Krasnoyarsk, uh, yeah, 
And we organized uh, single strikes in different cities. It was before the pandemic, and we were just about 20 people in Russia, but like several cities. And like uh, a lot of media reported about it because like Greta Thunberg uh, reposted and it was like, uh, uh, yeah, it was some solidarity action. It was something new for Russia because we starting to do this uh, things like <laughs> solidarity solidarity is a new thing for Russia, but when you're a climate activist, you're starting to understand these connections. That's why like I'm talking not just about uh, a climate, I'm talking about politics, I'm talking about everything because I'm starting to understand that we need solidarity, we need this, we need to unite to fight this crisis. That's why like I'm being uh, starting to be more political. It's uh, it's uh, like I'm starting to feel myself as a part of a bigger society, uh, independent like civil society in Russia. And there is civil society in Russia. Uh, the situation is changing, even though like there is a lot of repressions and stuff like that. But people uh, educating themselves, they starting to understand that it's not okay. That it's not okay that one single person decides everything in Russia. And if you want somebody to be released from prison if he, he or she is prosecuted unfairly you should like go to the president because we need to change quickly and we need everyone in this process so we need opportunities and a working system and the system in russia doesn't work at all so of course yeah there are a lot of problems and uh floodings wildfires everything and we trying to do uh, to start to talk about it, even though like we just starting to do this because like if in Europe like about just transition, people were talking uh, for years and years. Uh, we in Russia just starting this uh, discussion. It's quite difficult because propaganda has more resources, of course. It's getting better quite fast because the situation about climate awareness uh, when I was uh, I started my strikes was quite different. It was much worse and the i was feeling myself as like people couldn't understand what i'm doing like as yeah uh, like i'm an insane striking for <laughs> bad weather or something like that so the situation is changing and it's great that experts uh, did this work they uh, they they written russian green uh green deal and we organized campaign about it as well like uh, a lot of independent politicians uh, signed in for this green deal about 50 politicians some of them now uh, not in russia because of the political persecution some of them are in prison <laughs> but like russian future are uh, for green deal so a lot of real russian people supporting green deal uh, but yeah, <laughs> because of the political situation, we cannot promote it on the political level because you cannot take part in the politics in Russia if you are independent. So yeah, I am not sure about uh, like Russian plans to be carbon neutral till 2060 or whatever because it's not important uh, uh, because like Russia can like decrease emissions, of course, it can do that. And I had a joke on my Twitter about it, like I, I had written that, oh, maybe Russia will be carbon neutral till 2024 uh, because they will jail everyone. And uh, if you are not jailed, you will be declared foreign agents, so your emissions will be foreign. So we should remember that action on climate should be not just about climate, but about community, about people. Uh, because a lot of people uh, now uh, feel the, themselves like uh, left out from everything. Uh, we see how it's happening with the COVID. Yeah, because uh, people, uh, yeah, people don't understand how working vaccine. They they do not have this knowledge about like how it's working, but they afraid, and they starting to fight even from uh, against things that are like good for them. So if we want to educate people, if people won't be able to take part in climate action and if people will be will be left behind, then they won't do climate action. And we need everyone in this uh, crisis. It should be political because like the, gov the current gov the government failing us, uh, they were talking, they, they did nothing in 20 years. And so it's pretty much the same government. They did nothing on climate in 20 years. Because like, I think change is coming to Russia because these people in the government, they, they do not have the trust from the people. Thank you, Arshak. That was, uh, that was inspiring. Uh, and even though you had some, some pessimistic <laughs> things to tell us, I think your, 
your message about solidarity and about working together uh, inside Russia to affect change is, is an inspiring message. And my first question is about um, where change is coming from inside Russia. And on the outside, you know, many of us only focus on Moscow and sometimes maybe St. Petersburg. Uh, but obviously, Russia is a very big country and there's a lot going on inside the country. And of course, there was some news coverage of the protests that took place in Khabarovsk around the removal of the governor there. We've heard, you know, obviously, reports from other parts of the country about protests. So my question is about um, change coming from the region. Uh, yes, we have uh, some examples of regions who uh, develop new sectors, green sectors. Uh, they have done a research on regions recently and they had some very interesting results. Yeah, exactly. We did a ranking of uh, openness to the Green Deal uh, in Russian region and yeah, they have estimation of uh, different regional measures and we just see that uh, no one region uh, in Russia is green, <laughs> but if we collect some green measures from different regions, <laughs> we can uh, create a one green region. Uh, because one region like a Sakhalin uh, region has a goal for carbon neutrality. But sometimes we have some question for this, but anyway, it's the first region which has this goal. And yeah, uh, for example, Ulyanovsk region, uh, they talk about, Tatiana talks about, about wind, uh, wind energy cluster. They have a goal uh, for renewables. Uh, for example, they want to achieve uh, a 30% uh, of like share in energy uh, in renewables uh, by uh, 2025. 42 region uh, have different uh renewable energy projects it's like more than it's it's half of uh it's half of russian regions and yeah it's also can like give some inspiration <laughs> and sometimes we see that some region is more progressive than federal government and they for example uh very uh, openness and they talk directly about phase out from fossil fuel, for example. Excellent. And, and Arshak, you, you talked about uh, protests elsewhere. And I, I mean, you were in Moscow, but there were other cities that participated. And I'm wondering, is there, is there more green activism uh, outside of Moscow in some parts of the country than inside Moscow? Yeah, uh, you know, like Moscow is the biggest city in uh, Russia and there are about 20 millions of people. And when like we were organizing strikes for 70 or 50 people and in smaller cities where the population is about a million or two, there were the same amount of people. So it was strange because like we are a rich city where people have time, knowledge, everything. And we, uh, uh, yeah, the movement was like even in some cities uh, even bigger. Yeah, it was before the pandemic because now it's uh, quite difficult to survive in different regions uh, because uh, like Moscow is a rich city. And for me, it's like something about climate justice. Uh, you were right about that. Like, yeah, and you were right about that change is coming maybe from the regions because like uh, infrastructure, oil, gas infrastructure going to collapse because of the permafrost melting. And so, so and uh, anyway there will be action because everything gonna collapse <laughs> uh, so yeah, we had protests about garbage in our Kangliisk region they were protesting ga against garbage from Moscow and they won there was a victory in uh, Bashkarstan when they were protesting against destruction of their uh, it's something like a mountain there are victories just in environmental protests if your protest is political it's quite difficult to have a victory but if your protest is environmental it's uh, sometimes it's happening and people are already uh, having some victories. Uh, I think change is coming, yeah, from regions because, yeah, in Moscow, in rich cities, yeah, it's quite, uh, yeah, it's not like in the regions. P people not connected to the nature and, yeah, it's quite a problem. 
Excellent, thank you. Thank you all for that. We do have a question um, from Rolf. Uh, what could be the drivers of change? Uh, and, and you've mentioned some of them, of course. I mean, the, the, the climate crisis itself is, is driving change, whether it's permafrost melting. Interest of uh, media, because media started right like much more about climate uh, crisis and like some economic of climate crisis and also of course uh, people see around them the climate am anomalies like uh, uh, very cold uh, winter like strong uh, rains and so on and also it uh, drive them to uh, like care about like this and another thing it's of course uh, mm, trade uh, it's international trade uh, because European Union uh, like introduced some uh, border uh, tax uh, and uh, like some other measures uh, for uh, like uh, carbon regulation and uh, pricing of like carbon and yeah of course the Russian business care about this too and. Uh, uh, push the government to do something. I would strongly agree with the trade aspect. So yes, Obama is uh, influencing uh, Russia a lot and the demand from foreign partners and foreign investors uh, for Russian companies to decarbonize. Uh, and I would say that economics uh, is maybe the strongest um, motivation in Russia to decarbonize and to uh, combat climate change. And uh, the situation is very favorable for that. So wind and solar energy is the cheapest globally at the moment. Our wind power plants can produce uh, renewable electric power just for 1.7 rubles. And this is cheaper than uh, electric power in the wholesale uh, market, even including the capacity payments. So it means that in, in several years, wind energy will be totally competitive in Russia. That, that suggests that, uh, that cities or regions could make their own decision that based on the price of electricity, they will invest in wind to make their own city or their own region um, more sustainable or and you know, it's kind of a, a decision not to stand against the federal government politically, but a decision to embrace cheaper electricity locally. Vasily and Tatiana were talking about CBAM, which is a carbon border adjustment mechanism, part of the European Green Deal, which would um, effectively, although it's not described this way, but effectively apply a tariff to, uh, to goods coming in from outside if they uh, are dirty in their uh, manufacturing or production. Um, and Russia, of course, uh, exports a good amount of stuff to Europe, uh, including fossil fuels, including as uh, Tatiana said coal. And so the CBAM would affect Russia a great deal. So as a driver, pressure on Russian businesses uh, and pressure by Rus Russian businesses, I think it could be very powerful indeed. Justice should be a driver for action for climate action because Russia is a rich country, but it's one of the richest country in the world. We are on the first place for water supply, and so we should play our role uh, of saving the planet, I think, and other nations against uh, the terrible economical and societal consequences of climate crisis. So we should talk about more about justice, because when you talk about economy, it's like kind of strange, like, oh, our world is going to collapse, and maybe we should do something because our economy will want to do well so i think i young people deserve to have a future so i think it's uh it's not about economy it's not about like things like that yeah of course for the business and for uh, the government it's quite a point because they do not <laughs> they don't care about people uh but i think we shouldn't forget about people <laughs> obviously in the past during the soviet period uh, the Soviet Union uh, thought about justice in, in, in a certain way in terms of um, building solidarity relationships with revolutionary movements, as well as movements that were considered to be sympathetic to the Soviet Union. 
Um, and during the Putin period, uh, there has been uh, some some sort of continuation of that, obviously not according to Soviet principles, but uh, there was certainly a campaign to um, uh, to send uh, the um, the Russian vaccine uh, Sputnik um, to to other countries. As a, I'm curious whether uh, there is a possibility that even the Putin government see itself eventually not only as a as um, having a green new deal at home or a green deal at home but actually you know forging a new relationship with other countries based on a transition in energy russia was trying to promote nuclear energy but we know that it's not a real solution it's expensive and uh, yeah it's a false solution uh so it's quite a problem because uh yeah, Russia, <laughs> Russian government, not Russia, having solidarity support to other regimes like itself. They help into Belarusian regime, uh, and it's wrong because we shouldn't help to dictators to uh, to uh, to have more power and yeah and uh, to repress their own people. Uh, so it's quite a problem. Yeah, it's uh, almost the same uh, what it was during the Soviet period. And we need different kind of solidarity because I am a part of global movement. And when I was arrested, a lot of activists from Fridays for Future were protesting the Russian embassies to support me because it was not right that I was arrested. And we trying to build a new kind of solidarity, not political, not not about money or not about uh, yeah, gaining more power because uh, now for the Russian government, everything is about power. It's not about saving our, saving our future, doing some good stuff. It's about power. Excellent. Um, as we head toward the, the end here, I did want to ask a question about whether there are people in the Russian government, um, either uh, at the federal level or in the regions, who could be the basis for an energy transition inside Russia. In other words, they might be, they might even be quiet. <laughs> they might not be uh, completely open about their sympathies, but are there such people? I mean, again, thinking back to, you know, say a, a Gorbachev who, who was in the regions uh, formulating his ideas about reforming uh, the Soviet infrastructure and the po politics of the country. Is there a green Gorbachev somewhere in Russia today who's in, inside the, the state, um, and perhaps even inside Putin's party, United Russia, but who might uh, be uh, a force? I think that we are in such a situation now that anyone in the government can be can become such a force uh, because the situation in, in the world is changing very fast and many green solutions are becoming more and more economically attractive and becomes more and more clear that uh, to have uh, sources of income in the future, Russia needs to develop some new industries. Yeah. I think that some progressive uh, in energy issue, uh, it's like quite, I think quite weak and not, not uh, don't have a lot, enough power. But uh, I think that, yeah, I agree with Tatiana that uh, everything can um, be changed uh, like very fast. And especially the price of renewables is can be big a driver uh, for to this change because yeah the big uh, the main um, the main plan uh, for energy transition in Russia is is to develop uh, nuclear energy which is uh, uh, super uh expensive and uh, like it's too long to build new uh in like stations and so on and so on uh and yeah renewables uh every year may maybe not year every month uh, became cheaper and cheaper and i think it will be just uh some natural process that renewables will just uh, uh, replace uh, all other uh, energy sources uh, and even in Russia. I think that uh, everybody who have like some brain can understand this. And 
you know, even in government. Arshak, I, I know you have a pretty pessimistic view of the government, so I'm not going to ask you <laughs> that same question about a green Gorbachev, but I do, I am interested in hearing what you think about what uh, Tatiana and Vasily are saying about the economic drivers. And I know you, you've stressed justice and you've stressed the importance of, of, um, of activism, but how, how do you evaluate these economic drivers, the falling price of, of renewables, the push maybe by Russian businesses to, to embrace an energy transition? Yes, it is a positive trend, but maybe not now, because like we're getting from renewable just 1% of energy, so it's almost nothing if you thinking about the situation in Russia. So maybe in a few years, uh, it uh, will be able to uh, uh, play its role because, so yeah, we, need, we have a fossil fuel uh, lobbyist and we don't have a renewable energy lobbyist in Russia. Change is coming anyway. I'm not sure how it will happen in Russia, but it will happen because, yeah, there is no option or to give up on our future. Everyone should play its ro or their own roles, like activists putting more pressure, NGOs uh, doing some other stuff, and economists uh, talking about the yeah, green economy is better than <laughs> not green economy. So everyone should play their, their roles and maybe we will achieve something <laughs> together. When people outside Russia ask, well, what can we do? Is there anything we can do to help this? Uh, situation inside Russia to help advance an energy transition and and bearing in mind what uh, you you have talked about in terms of the foreign agent law which has been used to um, to really make it difficult for NGOs and social movements inside Russia to, to operate when they're branded uh, when they're labeled uh, foreign agents if they get money from outside organizations so keeping that in mind, what can people do outside of Russia to, to help this situation? I would answer uh, as an economist, uh, so uh, create new economic opportunities for economic cooperation between Russia and other countries that might be interesting for the Russian economy. Do you have any examples of that? Of course, there is a lot of uh, international cooperation in the renewable sector. So most uh, enterprises that function in Russia, they involve some sort of uh, cooperation with other countries and with foreign companies as well. I think you can do your best because it's easy for you to figure out what you can do because you're living in different conditions. And yeah, uh, like a lot of my friends, act activists, uh, have, like moving to other countries to have better education than I do. And I'm doing the grassroots work in Russia. So a lot of people are trying to educate themselves. And I think they know better than I do what you can do to, to change the situation in Russia. So I think you know better. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. And Vasily, you get the last word. <laughs> That's a very difficult question. Yes, uh, you mentioned about foreign agents, agents, and um, yeah, I, I I had two thoughts uh, also, um, um, like which <laughs> Tatiana uh, I can uh, support which Tatiana uh, thought about to support like some green initiatives in Russia uh and also to create new business opportunities and don't like afraid the russian business and like maybe to uh, help us uh, to uh, like improve and develop our green technologies it's one side from one side from another side it's uh, maybe listen from the russian activists and to be care about like what they talk about and uh, uh, like maybe like organize more this uh, more events like this <laughs> uh, to like listen to some real situation because uh, of course like uh, our uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs talk a lot about how Russia is beautiful and do a lot and how clean our energy and so on 
uh yeah and we can provide like another <laughs> alternative uh picture of russian and what we can uh at uh what we uh suggest uh, what we can do uh for a uh, green transition and like green development and green future so thank you and uh, i'd like to say goodbye take care now <laughs>